energy is essential to life and all living organisms. And to sustain our way of living, we need more and more of it. The big question, where do we get it all from? Of course, directly or indirectly, the source of all available energy on Earth, well, it's the sun. So, where better to get the energy to fulfill our needs than from solar? History tells us that in the 7th century BCE, solar energy was used. People used sunlight to light fires with magnifying materials. And later in the 3rd century BC, the Greeks and the Romans were known to harness solar power with mirrors to light torches for religious ceremonies. These mirrors became a normal tool and were referred to as burning mirrors. Chinese civilization documents the use of these mirrors for the same purpose later in 20 AD. Another early use for solar energy that's still popular today was the concept of sunrooms in buildings. The sunrooms used massive windows to direct the sunlight into one concentrated area. And some of the iconic Roman bathhouses, typically those situated on the south facing side of buildings, were sunrooms. Later in the 1200s AD, ancestors to the Pueblo Native Americans, known as the Anazi, situated themselves on south facing adobes on cliffs to capture the sun's warmth during the cold winter months. So, what I'm saying is that solar, particularly solar thermal, has been with us for centuries. The thing is, we're sporadic. We don't make much use of it, and then we have a huge effort to make a lot of use of it, and then it all falls by the wayside. And you have to ask yourself why. Well, I would argue it's because solar is actually trouble, more trouble than easier options, and that's why. The only time we turn to solar is when those easier options become scarce or more difficult than solar. Now, for a very long time, of course, singly, the most important material for construction and energy, well, it was wood. So there was a time when people scoffed at the idea of a shortage of trees, but in the period from Elizabeth I to James I, that's 1534 to 1696, there was an event called the Great Clearance, where people mercilessly chopped down the trees. Why the deforestation? Well, it was the headlong rush into agriculture and industry and the growth of the population. From 1530 to 1690, the population doubled from 3 million to 6 million. And of course, a lot of people were rushing into London. At the end of 1690, the population of London was over half a million people. And that was a huge demand for construction and fuel. So during this time, the amount of land covered by forest fell to 3.6% and of course the price of timber rocketed up. Fear of running out of wood of course served as a huge impetus for the development of solar power as an energy source. By the 1700s and 1800s, researchers and scientists had had huge success using sunlight to power ovens for long voyages. They also harnessed the power of the sun to produce solar-powered steamboats. Now, it probably culminated with Augustine Mouchot, who demonstrated a solar collector with a cooling engine and made ice cream at the 1878 Universal Exhibition in Paris, and that was quickly followed by the Ericsson engine in 1868. Now, the first installation of solar thermal energy equipment was at Schumann, 1910, when he ran a steam engine from the steam produced by sunlight using parabolic reflectors. Of course, it didn't happen. We turned to coal. Small quantities of coal had been burned in Europe since the 12th century, in areas where it had been accessible from outcropping seams. But medieval craftsmen turned up their noses at coal fires because of the smoke and the fumes it tarnished their wares. And then that all changed. By the time of the Civil War in the 1640s, Londoners depended on coal to heat their homes despite the grime. And coastal shipments grew 20 times between 1550 and 1700. And of course, coal, with improvements in coal technology in the way of burning it and using it, came to dominate the industrial landscape of Britain. And it could arguably be said that coal was one of the main reasons for the success of the Industrial Revolution. Of course, coal continued its dominance until the discovery and widespread use of oil. In the 50s, there was a huge explosion of interest, again, in solar and solar thermal. Now, my argument is that this only happens when there's a fuel crisis because solar's a pain. So what was the fuel crisis? Well, the war. The war had just ended, and of course, 
All of the production had been sent to the front. Domestic consumption was held back for the war effort. And this continued. Now, at the end of the war, an awful lot of soldiers came back home. And they came back home to a very different world. But they had sacrificed. They had died. And they wanted a home of peace. So there was a huge building campaign because soldiers were basically living in camps. That building campaign meant that there was a need for energy. The war effort and the recovery from the war effort while Europe rebuilt itself meant there was no oil. And that created a fuel crisis from about 1947 through to about 1956 when everybody focused on solar. Solar PV was extremely early stage stuff. People had theorised, but it wasn't until 1916 when the first experimental evidence for the uh, photovoltaic effect was produced. And it wasn't until 1932 when cadmium selenide showed the same effect and the first solar cell was built by Audubert and Storer. It was in 1954 that the first silicon solar cells were built and they were only 4% efficient. Solar photovoltaics were in their early stage development and not that much use. Solar thermal, though, it had centuries behind it. And it was in 1947 that Liberty Owens and Ford Glass Company produced a book called Your Solar House, which predominantly was a guide to solar architectures and the use of solar thermal. In 1956, there was a world symposium of the practical use of solar energy held in Phoenix, Arizona, and it was reported in the April edition of Popular Mechanics again in 1956. And what they featured were a whole load of solar thermal devices. Things like a solar cooker, solar oven, solar distillation. A solar distillation was by Maria Telkus and it was produced in the war for the emergency desalination of seawater for downed pilots. And she's reported to have saved many, many lives. She's also credited with the creation of the first solar thermal system using a phase change material, which was uh, Glauber's salt, as it happens. So what happened to it all? Well. Nuclear power came along. Nuclear power came along. The oil crisis at the end of the war ceased. Production went back into full swing. And those are so much more convenient and easy than providing our own solar power. Solar as it stood then died a death. Now you might think with this argument that the next fuel crisis, which was in 1970s, would have resurrected solar. And it sort of did. But by this time, of course, solar photovoltaics had made great strides. It was in 1964 that the first solar panel was attached to a space mission by NASA. So solar photovoltaics had a lot of research put into them. Solar thermal, which is a bit more of a pain, and we still had nuclear power in 1976, meant that during 1976, the main resurgence of solar was in solar photovoltaics. In prehistory, we needed power, we turned to solar. We had an energy crisis in the 16th century, we turned to solar. We had an energy crisis in the 20th century, we turned to solar. And now, in our energy crisis, we're turning to solar. Of course, it differs a little bit in that we're turning to solar photovoltaics and we seem to be forgetting about solar thermal, but solar thermal can contribute a huge amount. Solar thermal is incredibly active as a research area and it's really easy to do. All you actually need is some black plastic pipe and the sun will shine on it, absorb the heat and heat the water and that is solar thermal. But the height of the technology is this. This is an evacuated solar thermal tube. The job of this is to take the sun's energy and its light and turn it from shortwave to longwave. Longwave is heat. And if you look down there, you'll see how red that gets because it's taking the sunlight in that black coating. 
changing it to heat and reflecting it into the inside of this and it's a vacuum tube so it's got this silvery bit at the bottom this silvery bit is called a getter usually it's something like barium but any reactive metal will do it so you can use aluminium sodium potassium anything but it's usually barium its job is to absorb any extra oxygen between these two glass walls to make sure that a vacuum is kept now these things well, there's no moving parts, they last virtually forever. They've got a lifespan of expected somewhere around about 25 years plus, so they last a long time doing that job. And this coating, the black coating that you can see, that's magnetron spotted. Basically, it fires metal ions using something very similar to your microwave oven to coat those ions on that glass. That is multi-layer and its job to take the sunlight and turn it into heat. This is a fantastic piece of equipment and surprisingly enough this which is uh, 58 millimeters round by 500 millimeters long is 10 pounds. It's crazy cheap. The efficiency of these things is actually crazy. This is somewhere between 94 and 96 percent efficient. That is it takes that sunlight and changes 94 to 96 percent of it into heat. Now you don't often see them used just like this. This is a conversion tube. What you see is a piece of copper pipe going as a U, going in and out. See it cold water in, hot water out. That's the very basic of it. But you can use something called a heat pipe. Now a heat pipe is just a bit of copper tubing with a bulb at the top filled with a liquid that evaporates at a low temperature so something like isopropanol alcohol or even better acetone and you can make them yourself really easily and we've made them all you do is take a piece of copper pipe cap one end put some acetone in it heat it gently when the acetone is steaming crimp the end let it cool and you've got yourself a heat pipe now what happens is the liquid at the bottom is cold when it gets hot, it evaporates into the top as hot gas. That hot bit is put into a container of water, and of course it starts to heat the water. It gets cold and drips back down to the bottom, and it continues that as a heat pump with no moving parts. So equally, the lifespan of a heat pipe, which is also incredibly efficient, is years. It's a huge amount of time. Normally those heat pipes are rested on a little aluminium fin to keep them in the centre of the tube. So you see this sort of stuff all over the place in hot countries like Australia. Here in the UK, for some reason, they're not nearly as popular as photovoltaics, and I would contend that's because they're a bit more trouble. Now you can just buy these, and as I say, they range between sort of 10 and 20 pounds, depending on the length. You get a whole load of them, stick them on your roof, and you're going to have hot water. The idea of making as much hot water as you want, of course, appeals to me, and I could get a load and stick them on the roof. Or I could do something a bit more fun that's more useful to me, because I drink a ton of this stuff, and my kettle is three kilowatts, so every time I turn that on, I burn the electricity. Now we have done this before. We did this before by using a bit of drainage pipe. We're going to make a solar thermal kettle. But of course we've got the 3D printers now, the filament printers. So although you can do that by hand, we can do a prettier job of it with a 3D printer. So I've printed off a whole load of 3D parts. And of course, it's in Tinkercad. The link is in the description at the bottom. And anybody who wants these parts is more than welcome to them. Just go there and print them off yourself. And we're going to build that solar kettle using the 3D parts, of which the most... <laughs> complicated bit is the base unit here. Now these kettles don't work particularly well if they're upright, you need them put them at an angle. Here in the UK, because we're in the northern hemisphere, that angle is 45 degrees spring and autumn, 20 degrees in the summer and 60 degrees in the winter. So with my tube in there, it's already looking like a solar kettle. Now it does have a top here we go, that goes right there, and between those two is going to be a hinge, because this works better if we can fold out a reflector so that the sun will hit the reflector and of course get reflected back in here. So it doesn't only get the direct sunlight on there, it gets the reflected sunlight from the back. In order to do that, we need a reflector. Now a reflector can be anything you want, so a bit of shiny aluminium rolled into a curl would be quite nice. What I'm going to use is this stuff. This is 110 guttering. 
So it's really easy to get hold of and it's sawed to length to go on the hinge between those two there. It will be closed for, for carrying it and then you'll be able to open it to reflect the sun into the um, solar kettle. But of course it needs a hinge. The hinge section is here from the Tinkercad file and it goes together like that to make the hinge and we put a bit of 8mm threaded bar down there to complete that hinge. But that is anything but a reflector right now. So I want to show you this stuff. Now I'm not getting paid to do this, I bought this and I discovered it a while ago. It's a Rust-Oleum paint product called Mirror Effect. Now, mirror paints have been very disappointing. This stuff is astonishing actually how easy and well it forms a mirror. So I'm going to spray paint the inside of these with mirror effect to create a couple of curved mirrors. And that's what that stuff looks like. Now, you could probably get the same effect pretty much if you just stuck some aluminium down there, but it does give a really nice mirror finish and it's a piece of cake. Now, you might have noticed into this base unit I've put these three bars. They're 43 centimetres, 8 millimetre bar. I bolt them down with a cat nut and a nut and then this central spacer because this bit, the tube, actually just goes in there and rests in there. So that's going to rest in there like that. Obviously we need to put these onto some kind of hinge which is... There we go. Exactly what that is. You find two parts, 43 centimeter, 8 millimeter bar, makes those hinges. And this is just the wings here. It's got a slight curve to it, and the wing glues on there like that. So we glue them on there, and then we can put this cap piece on. That big hole fits on there like that. And there's a corresponding big hole at the bottom that fits in there like that, and then this top piece screws onto there. So they're glued on and they've got the bar back in and <laughs> now they close up. That's really cool actually. Okay, so we fitted our reflectors and they close up rather nicely. And I put this on top, that part there, because that part is the bit that takes a swivel foot. Because you'll notice as we're building it, it wants to do that. Now it's set at 20 degrees and I have this part here and I put a bit of aluminium bar on it because that goes like that to stop the whole thing tilting over and of course to do that we have a peg with a hole in it. The peg goes in there and then that goes in the peg. So the last bit is the lid. Now the lid's got this indentation in it because I bought this. It's a thermometer and the thermometer goes up to 120 degrees and goes through the hole in the middle and the lid goes on so we can see how hot our water is going and of course when we're not using it we can close it up and when we want to use it we can open them up. Now there's a couple of things I might actually do with that to improve it. One would maybe be an adjustment for that so we could adjust that to a, a sort of position that we want. But you can buy these things, they're actually about 60 65 pounds on Amazon and they're made out of plastic so the material is going to be good. I did put a piece of string right there to stop that collapsing any further. A nice adjustment won't be on there to put a block on it so that it would only open that far but that is the kettle ready to go. Let's fill it up with some water see if we can brew a coffee. I filled it up with water, we'll put the cap on with the thermometer to read it and then we'll expose it to the sun and see how long it takes to heat that up. Okay, that actually worked. It made me a nice cup of hot coffee and probably a couple of cups in there. Now it's in line with what I said about solar because this does boil the water but it takes about 80 minutes to do it. So it's not in instant, it's not like flicking on your kettle but it really does work and I checked the price of them. They're actually about 100, 120 pounds which is crazy money and there's no way I spent that on building this. It was fun to build anyway. This metal coating, the black coating that you can see that's usually a transition metal so something like tungsten or cobalt or nickel in a ceramic and as I say it's magnetron coated so it's a pretty technical piece of kit that really does the job the problem is not particularly quickly but if you set it up and you've got a bit of patience then you're no longer using a three kilowatt kettle I found it a lot of fun actually and it's a nice piece of kit so the local government in my area has decided to ban these things they're disposable portable barbecues and apparently, if you believe the stories, they're worse than bear traps, causing fires and havoc everywhere and damaging kids running around in play areas. So much so, 
The local governments are banning these all over the place. Now there is a call for a national ban, but so far that hasn't actually got very far. The government's just shifted it to the local government level and the local government are uh, invoking their nuisance laws to make them illegal in public places and in my case, 14 miles of beach. It has become such an issue that the major retailers, uh, Asda, Sainsbury's, Little Marks and Spencer's, the to name but a few, have removed it from their shelves for sale to the public and the stated reason being public safety. If a ban does go in place, of course there's not a lot we can do about it and that's going to be the end of beach barbecues. Unless of course you drag down a non-portable version, break the law, suffer the fine, or buy one of these. What is that price? They're stupid money. So unless you're prepared to spend stupid money, pre-cook your food, or make something yourself. Now you can make such a thing using these, and these are stunningly available. If you put in solar thermal evacuated tube into a Google search, you'll come across loads of them. Now you can get these in a whole range of sizes. I mean, they go up to a couple of meters long. This will go up to, uh, I think 150 millimeters, which is six inches. So that's huge. I mean, bear in mind, you can buy that for about $55 if you buy it direct from China. If you buy it in Europe, it's actually about 250 pounds. So it's quite a markup really, but then they do have to get it through customs and ship it. But these are available in a whole range of sizes. We're going to use this one because we've got it. But if we were to get one at six inches, then we could make an absolutely huge oven. Now, we used this to make this solar kettle and essentially a solar barbecue is exactly the same thing. But instead of being like that, it's like that. That's all, all the difference there is. If I were to take this and lay it just like that, I'd have myself a solar barbecue. Because that's not particularly attractive, what we want is something that's maybe a bit more barbecue-esque. So of course I turned to Tinkercad and I printed off these four parts. The Tinkercad files are freely available and I'll put the link in description. So these four parts are all we need to make our solar barbecue, plus one of these and this reflector and hinge section at the back. Now we have two ends to this. We have a blanked off end and we have a, an end with a hole right the way through it. For the blanked off end you can see I put three 8mm threaded rods at 43 centimeters each because our tube goes in there like that. This end then goes on there like that until it meets those three screws, the uh, three bolts, sorry. But before you do that, you've got to insert your reflector and you'll notice that there's a big old hole here to take the reflector and equally there's a big old hole here. The reflector goes in that hole like that and that's it shut up. Now we can put the top bit on. Yeah, that's it together. And as you can see, looking remarkably like the kettle. These bits are feet. Okay, so we put the feet on by resting that in there. But the side goes on that. Of course, we can glue the feet down or put a screw in them. The reflector opens up and that's it finished. Now we need to actually fix that and as I say you can put a screw in it and if you want to make sure that this bit is makes a 45 degree angle there and then fix on the feet either by gluing and screwing. Put together and ready to go. Now I did make a little bit of a food shelf right here from some bent stainless steel. I had some sheet stainless steel lying around. There we go. I cut a strip of it and bent it over into that U and put a plastic handle. Now I guess you could use a bit of aluminium like say from an old computer case or something like that. But your food goes in there, that goes in there and we're ready to cook. So when it's shut, it's actually stunningly neat and kind of portable. Anyway, we're having another glorious day, so let's get something in there and cook it. And I'm going to go for some sausages. Okay, rumour is this should take 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, hey, they're hot and they look cooked. Let's put them in some bread and try them. Well, surprisingly enough, it worked to a treat. Now, I did have to wait for the sun, we started having a cloudy day and we had to wait for a period 
for the sun to come out to cook the sausages but it cooked them fine and in about 20 minutes or so because these things remember are being sold and there's cooking times and um, different configurations all over the place my argument is they're a bit expensive i mean this is 120 pounds you can get a two barrel version which is 250 pounds you can get the six inch version which is 650 pounds and that strikes me as crackers when you can buy these for somewhere like 10 pounds and build your own okay we've used 3d printing but you could build your own for a probably 15 pounds or so but it does do the job and it does do it within the time so I'm not, not really surprised but quite impressed and I'm going to enjoy my bag, my sausage sandwich and my cup of coffee so if you think about it since the industrial revolution and right up to now we're in the age of steam Steam is incredibly important and any of the electricity that you're using, if it's not being generated by renewables, is being generated by steam. If you take a nuclear power station for example, what it does is it uses a nuclear reaction to create heat, which it then boils water with to create steam. That steam is fed into a turbine and that's connected to the generator. Oil plants work the same way, so do coal, so do gas. We are producing steam and steam is incredibly important to us because it's steam that we use to generate electricity. Now traditionally what we do is take a bulk body of water, apply some heat at the base point and hey presto boil the water we get steam. And we can do exactly the same thing with solar thermal as we demonstrated with the solar kettle. That's exactly what we were doing. And of course they do this on a large scale. The large scale uses something called a heliostat. A heliostat is basically a mirror that tracks the sun. They use mirrors to track the sun and focus it at one point and at that point is a big tub of water and they use the concentrated power of the sun to boil that water. Concentrated solar power generators using heliostats can reach incredible temperatures. A solar furnace in the Pyrenees in France that can reach three and a half thousand degrees Fahrenheit and the Spanish use heliostats to generate power in the megawatt range. Of course there are smaller scale replications of this all over YouTube and you'll see people arranging them in things like the focal point of parabolic mirrors to generate steam. However, it was Rice University that took it one step further. What they did was inject nanoparticles into the water. Now a nanoparticle is anything between 1 and 100 nanometers across, although it's sometimes used for 500 nanometers. But nanoparticles have some very very peculiar properties and one of them is to absorb all of the light which is why nanoparticles frequently appear black and then they give that absorbed energy back out as heat. What Nat Rice did was take that, add it to the water and pop it in some sunlight and even though the ambient around it was zero degrees centigrade, the water with the nanoparticles was still boiling because of that efficient exchange. They used metal nanoparticles and carbon nanoparticles so one imagines that graphene would do a very good job as well. They took that, arranged that in a parabolic reflector and and found themselves with an instant steam generator and of course steam doesn't only get used for power generation you can use it for sanitation as well. Rice did exactly that with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation they created a sanitation system where a single parabolic disc could be used by a family of four to sanitize their water. So the direct production of steam and the use of that steam in an engine of course is not in itself a particularly new idea, using the sun and concentrated solar certainly is, but the use of that in steam follows very much the pattern that we're used to in the use of steam for generation. But there is another alternative, there is another kind of heat engine that can be used and that's the Stirling engine. Now, the Stirling engine is often seen as the poor cousin of the steam engine, it's less energy dense being the major disadvantage of it however it is mechanically simpler more robust and more tolerant and much cheaper to maintain and to build so sterling engines have an awful lot going for them and of course with the heat of the sun 
where it can heat air really, really easily. Heating air has basically two options. One is you can use concentrated solar power, heat up a metal block, that metal block will then heat the air and that can be used to run a Stirling engine and there are several prototypes around doing exactly that. And you've guessed it, there are alternatives. You can take a low thermal difference Stirling engine, the kind that runs off the heat of your hand or a hot cup of tea, paint the bottom black, turn it upside down, point it at the sun, and it will run because there's enough temperature difference there to run that Stirling engine. But if you're looking at that kind of thing, you really need to look at Red River College. And I have to take my hat off to them because they created a large scale flat panel Stirling engine made from readily available materials. It uses a bellows piston and a cam and the cam introduces a dwell in the movement of the displacer. Because of course what you're trying to do is heat and cool air and that takes time. In a normal Stirling engine, that happens pretty quickly. In Red River College, the dwell allows the air to sit in the space and warm up a bit or sit in the cold space and cool down a bit and that makes it very much more efficient. Apart from those two innovations it works just like any other Stirling engine. So if you think about it the range of ways of extracting power from the sun are much broader than photovoltaics or simple steam. I mean we're an inventive lot, aren't we? We can go right the way from cutting edge nanotechnology and extreme engineering to a place where anybody can actually do it. It's one of those things that, well, I think it's staggering when you think about it. So I suppose a case could be made that arguably the parabolic reflector is at the heart of concentrated solar thermal. Certainly for things like oh, solar cookers, solar barbecues, solar kettles, it is, whether it's in a dish or a trough, it's a very important aspect. And of course you see lots of people making them in lots of different ways. And each of them, well, they've got their merits and their demerits. Quite a popular one is to take a mylar sheet and either subject it to to pressure or vacuum to form a parabolic reflector. It works really, really well, but it is a mylar sheet. So <laughs> it's not particularly hard wearing. And in order to get the pressure on or the vacuum formed and maintain that vacuum, then it's a bit difficult and, and it doesn't really last very long. But it is certainly impressive and it certainly works. Other ways that you find are to make formers and then make separate petal-like sections and then to bend those sections and glue them together. And other ways are to find preformed parabolic curbs, parabolic dishes or troughs, and just coat them with a reflective layer. Now there's lots of reflective layers around. This is a quite a cool one. This is alum, sticky back aluminium. And you get it for heating, venting, uh, ventilation and air conditioning applications and basically it's nice and shiny and it's sticky so all you do is cut it to length, peel it off and stick it down. Brilliant. You can get this kind of thing. This is um, a metal foil. It's actually a plastic that's got a sticky back on it. Decal sell it and it comes in a whole variety including this nice silvery mirror form and there's a, a silvery copper form. I think that that would actually make quite a nice uh, mirror that probably would be a bit of a product. I quite like that anyway. And then of course you can get good old kitchen foil. Here we go extra strong kitchen foil and that's nice and shiny. For that you need to glue it down and so some kind of spray adhesive and you cut your sections off of that and then just glue it to the surface as a parabolic surface. So there's a, a ton of ways of approaching this but some of them are a little less desirable than others, some of them take a bit more effort than others and some of them are not very replicatable which is what makes them difficult. Now of the most replicatable it's probably the Cut some petals and fold up the flower. Probably one of the simplest ways of doing it is to grab yourself some backing material, whether it's cardboard, whether it's plastic, whether it's a bit of metal that you're going to bend up, wherever it is, something that's about a metre by a metre, and first draw it in half, draw it in four, draw it in eight, draw it in 16, and you'll get 16 divisions at 22 and a half degrees apart. Then we need to draw four circles. And those four circles 
have a radius of 75 millimeters, 254 millimeters, 400 millimeters, and 528 millimeters, which is that largest circle. You join those up and you create four circles to create this. Now when we've done that, what we're basically going to do is cut that out like the petals of a flower and we're going to fold those up. And in order to do that, we need to know how much of those petals to cut out. Well, clearly, R1 doesn't get cut at all. R1 is zero. R2, the distance away from one of those lines, R2 is 11 millimetres, R3 it's 29 millimetres and R4 it's 50 millimetres and it'll form you this. You get this beautiful petal shape and cut down one of those edges and then you'll be able to fold those up in according with bends and the dotted lines that you can see and they will fold up to make your parabola. Now at this point of course we haven't put anything reflective on it. If we want to put something reflective on it what we need to do is cut some little trapeziums like this and then we can stick those trapeziums onto our petals and then we can fold it up. Once you've covered that in your reflective material, folded it up and glued it, taped it, screwed it, whatever it is to um, fix it together, you'll make yourself a parabolic reflector. Now parabolic reflectors already exist of course because you can get them as sky dishes and people quite often use a sky dish that they cover again with a reflective material and that makes a really nice parabolic reflector. So you can look around for things that are already a preformed parabolic reflector. So something like a wok is going to do it, something like a sky dish and I have this, which is a Pennsylvania fire pit. Cost me 30 pounds in a local DIY store. Now, if I think about that, that seems like a lot of money to spend on a bit of bent metal. But then if you look at something like the former, you're going to need to make a mylar one. I mean, the mylar itself costs about one pound. If you intend on producing a few hundred of them, then making a former is really nice. But making a former and all the vacuum equipment, it's going to cost you a lot more than just sticking plastic onto a piece of bent metal. So I'm going to take some of this stuff and stick it onto my Pennsylvania fire pit to make my parabolic reflector. But there are a million ways of doing it. So there we go, there it is in the sun. Now let's try and do that old age demonstration and burn something. Okay, there it is angled into the sun. Now you can see the focus. See that? The light just comes together. And where that light is, look at it going already. That is some heat being generated there. And of course this is concentrated solar. So what we do is put our cook pot right there or whatever it else <laughs> we wanted to boil, burn or cook. <laughs> Okay, so there you go. Now, I quite like the copper here because it's got that sort of look about it. And it's more than likely what the Greeks and ancient Egyptians used, a good old bit of polished copper. Now, in a square metre, roughly about a kilowatt of sunlight energy falls. So we can collect that and use that and this concentrates it, which is why we get that dramatic burning effect. But the real takeaway from this is, um, to be honest, it's really non-critical. It's such a huge variety of ways of doing it. If it's not quite a parabola, it doesn't matter. It being as reflective as possible really matters, but you've got a huge range of materials you can choose from, including aluminium, reflective plastic, glass, mirrors, little squares. Just mind-boggling in what you can actually make this and how lax it is in the general shape of it. And to find the focal point, you just hold a bit of paper above it and see where it concentrates. So piece of cake to make a thing like this for things like solar cookers or um, concentrated solar thermal or boiling for a steam engine and all those kind of things are going to be adaptable to something like that. So I wanted to go through it mostly to show you um, what huge range of materials can be used, how easy it is to actually do. If you happen across something like a bin lid that will be basically what you want, that's going to be fine as well. And it can be made in, oh, half an hour or so if you use sticky back plastic. So we've been doing a lot on solar thermal and we've been using mirrors. And you might think, well, what about glass lenses? I mean, all we're really doing is concentrating and redirecting light. Surely lenses are the best thing for this job. And the same thought was kicking around in 1788 when Thomas Rogers proposed the same idea for putting into lighthouses. Now the Rogers lenses were well big, expensive, difficult to manufacture and hard to move around and of course everybody moaned about this and it was the um, Georges-Louis Leclerc, the Comte de Buffon. <laughs> 
I love that name. He first proposed it, but it was reinvented independently by Augustine Jean Fresnel. And of course, we know these lenses as Fresnel lenses. The Fresnel lens has the same optical distance, but far less material. Have a look at this cross section of two lenses and you can see how much less material is being used to get the same optical effect as a standard lens using a Fresnel lens. So a Fresnel lens is really just a cross section and that reduces the weight of everything, but it does make them a little difficult to make yourself. I mean, lenses are, are difficult to make yourself anyway, but Fresnel lenses, they're traditionally thought of as being something that must be machined. And of course, you find them all over the place these days. And in solar thermal, you find people experimenting with them with great big sheets of them. And of course, great big sheets can be expensive unless you find them in places like the back of an LCD TV, for instance. But the standard idea has been that a Fresnel lens is impossible to manufacture. So I've got seven meters of five millimeter polypropylene clear tube here that I plan on cording up and then filling with water and see if it operates as a Fresnel lens. And if it does, of course, that's kind of cool. So first things first, let's coil up this bad boy. It was really easy. All I actually did was take some of this one centimeter sized double sided tape, run it around the outside of the coil and then just coil it up and it coiled up incredibly quickly and incredibly neatly. Now it does have a habit of bending out, it's kind of lifting up like a cone, so I suspect a good idea would be to put some rods on it like that, just to help to keep it flat. So I might do that, but the next thing really to do is obviously fill it with water, and to fill it with water, we're going to syringe some in at the end until it comes out the other side. Filled it with, actually you can see it's a lens right there. Amazing. Anyway, I filled it with water and I bunged this bit of filler in here because I don't have a central lens. What we want to do is see if it'll actually focus the light to a center point. So I've made this so it's blank. And we're going to hold it up to a point light source, which is a torch over there, which is pointing on here. And if we hold that up and we move that towards it, you can actually see it focusing the light in the center. Okay, so you should be able to see the shadow. Now, as I move that lens in, you should see that bright focal point forming in the centre. Isn't that awesome? Okay, it's right there. There's a bright dot formed right there where, really, it ought to be a blank space. It should be a dark spot because I've got a big plug in there, remember. But we've got a focus of light right there in the centre. So that is actually operating as a Fresnel lens. That's very cool. So here's my setup. It's pretty simple, really. There's my Fresnel lens. I've got a couple of rulers, so I can just lever it up and down without it breaking apart. We've got a bit of scrap paper that we're going to try and focus the sun on. Now, it's a little bit cloudy in this afternoon because it's clouded over in the day, but we're still going to give it a go and see if we can burn that bit of paper with the power of concentrated sun because... <laughs> Who doesn't like burning things just to prove that the lens is concentrating solar power? Now, this wasn't my idea. This was suggested to me by AZ Pilotland, who said that he'd done this, and I thought it was such an awesome idea, I had to replicate it to see if it worked. Now, we've seen it focusing up roughly. Let's see if we can make it burn. She goes, see this little wisp of smoke? Okay, that, that is burning. I'm going to move the paper and we'll see if we can get another se section burning. But it's pretty obvious we're focusing the sun down. Uh, <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> Okay, that's awesome. Okay, so that actually 
work to treat. It was kind of impressive. And if we look at the cross-sectional area of a Fresnel lens again, then we compare it to our tube and we can see that the tube actually approximates the Fresnel lens, bending the light and bringing it all together in a focal point as it should. So it's thank you very much to AZ Pilot Land for suggesting this. It was really quite a lot of fun. Not sure about the point exactly because Fresnel lenses aren't that expensive, but they are used everywhere in solar thermal concentration as well as solar PV. And you know, you've got to be a bit more careful with solar PV because it's not only the light they concentrate, they concentrate in their heat and PV panels drop off dramatically the hotter they get. So you do have to be a bit more careful if you're going to try and do solar concentration with the PV panel. But solar thermal, brilliant if you're using Fresnel lenses, especially in large sizes, and you will see lots and lots of examples using Fresnel lenses. So we've had a brief look at solar thermal, right from commercial applications to smaller scale residential projects, from mega engineering to things you can make in your own garage. Now it's my contention that we don't pay that much attention to solar thermal for some strange reason. And I don't think it's because we live in Britain, because if that were true, then the same problems hit solar thermal, of course, hit solar voltaics because it's the sun. It's just that there's some reason that for us solar thermal is just not on the agenda and I don't really understand why because it is a, a fascinating subject and a fascinating technology for the generation of energy in both direct electricity and heat. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching and please do remember to like and subscribe.